Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today, wonderful day, because we are joined again by one of your favorite and my favorite guests on this show, listeners. Dr. Elizabeth Cohen is back with us, the divorce doctor. And, you know, first, I just want to... It is always such a pleasure to turn on my screen and know that I'm going to get to spend uh, some time with you and have you share, you know, your just wealth of knowledge with my listeners. So Dr. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on again today. Thank you so much, Susan, for having me. I feel the same way being able to talk to your audience and to have this platform. I feel like they're so well held and supported by you that they are open to um, challenging ways of thinking in a way that a lot of other audiences aren't. So I'm just incredibly um, honored to be here with you and your audience. They're so special. They, I, my, my listeners, I just, they, they really resonate with people who can bring them that wisdom and insight and expertise, but also personal experience. And you sort of, you are the, you know, the, the gold standard of being able to bring all that together. You've been on the show just to remind listeners, I think Elizabeth is the guest who has been on the show the most times (laughs) she has come on throughout. Well, COVID, you and I did so many episodes on all the different, you know, permutations of that. We've done episodes on anxiety and depression, and we've done episodes on toxic masculinity. And just really, we've been able to hit on so many topics, but you actually reached out to me with today's topic and two things. One, anytime you reach out to me with a topic, I'm going to say yes, but I will tell you this one really rang a bell for me, both personally in the world. I think this is a topic that we all need more insight into. And also because I know it's something that gets a little misunderstood sometimes for people, but can be really helpful. So I'm glad that today we're going to dive into the topic of forgiveness. Very important. Uh, But first, let me refresh everybody's memory as well about you. Because you are just to rem- for everyone to to remember, you're a clinical psychologist and you're CEO and director of your own uh, private practice, and you have other uh, f- clinicians who work with you. Um, and I know how busy you are there, so just a little brief thank you for making the time to do this as well. Um, you're also the creator of the online divorce course Afterglow, um, which helps people, women. Mostly, I think I do you have men that get into the program? No, I think, yeah, it's really, but it's to help afterglow is the perfect word for it, right? Because it's to help people in that space to thrive and and heal into that space beyond divorce, which is my, you know, my space that I I think is so important. And in fact, it engendered your best selling book, um, the light on the other side of divorce. And we have an entire episode that came out with Dr. Elizabeth when the book launched. Um, and you also have your own podcast, the divorce doctor podcast, which I was lucky enough to be on talking about what it's like for a divorce attorney to get divorced, which was the first time I'd really talked about that. So I'll link to everything in the show notes, but let's talk about forgiveness because as I said, really important topic gets glossed over, but let's start with why you reached out, why you wanted to talk about this. What is that personal note for you that, that you wanted to bring this up? Well, again, thank you so much for allowing me that platform. I'm so, so grateful. And this is, um, really a tender story for me, um, I wanted to reach out to your audience and to the people in my group. I shared about this story too, because it was one of those moments where I thought, holy cow, I never thought this would happen for me. Like this was one of those moments like the afterglow, like when I was in my divorce that I just thought I would never feel better. And then when I did, I felt like I had to share that with everybody because it, I really, really felt like I would always be stuck in resentment. And I want to share a little bit about my story. So forgive when I first started hearing about forgiveness, I, it was like nails on a chalkboard. So in my circumstance, um, 
with my divorce, my um, ex-husband suffers from a substance use disorder. Um, and I had two very young kids, a two-year-old and a six-month-old when I kicked him out. And I raised them alone for about a year and a half. And I raised them for a while during his active drinking. So stuff was really, really hard. And I was really angry and resentful. And I felt obviously like deeply unseen and um, not considered by him. And, and because of the disease of substance use, you put the substance above all else. So, that, and that was absolutely what happened. And um, in the process of healing from that, I also started, which I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but I also started feeling really resentful, realizing that there was addiction in my family of origin. So my mother and my father and started getting really angry at them too, for not being the right, the parents that I, that I wanted. And when people would say, oh, but they're your parents or one, um, you know, maybe you could forgive them. Or the thing that really drove me wild was people would, I would express my resentment with my ex-husband and they'd say, well, at least you got your children out of it. And I would look at them and say, well, I would have had other children. Like it, 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 this is not a, it, that, that, that's, what are you talking about? Like what happened? I felt very, very dismissive. And I don't know if your audience have, have heard that too, but it felt so dismissive, like my pain and my anger, like I should just push that away because I had kids. Like it just made no sense. And it felt like people were pushing their agendas on me. Like they were uncomfortable with my anger and frustration and resentment. And my resentment to my ex, you know, I feel, felt like I was holding on to this, um, grudge. Like I was waiting and waiting for him to say, I screwed you over. I left you with the kids. I left you financially responsible. I was terrible. I'm a horrible person. And I remember back in the day when my was saying to my therapist, like, I just want him to acknowledge it. I mean, it's like every therapy session. That's what I was saying. Like, I just want him to say that, just want him to say, it. and she said to me, and I wrote about this in the book. She said, what if he never says it? What if it never happened? And I was in that moment, I just sat with this feeling of, wait, I am, I'm like spending my life trying to get something said to me as if that's going to take away the pain that I felt. And she said, what if we stop trying to find a way for him to say that? And we just kind of let you feel the pain of what you went through. And in that moment with him, I really did let go of the resentment. I thought, you know what? Or just, I wouldn't say the resentment, but, but the need to, I guess I let go of the need for him to apologize and that therefore let go of the resentment. And then about three years later, when he had a child, he, we were just in the drop-off pickup. He looked at me and said, I don't know how you did this alone. This was, this must have been excruciating. And by that point, I hadn't even wanted the apology. And there it was. And that was like, the first layer of the resentment letting go. And I write about that in the book because it was really, really powerful. That was about, I'd say seven or eight years ago. And then was I resentful with him? I, I wouldn't say I held resentment, but I always had a little bit of a, like a, some, like a little something on my shoulder. You know, I wasn't, not a little, like a little, you know, like I didn't think he was that, I don't know. And <laughs> And recently what has happened, um, and to, you know, keep his anonymity as much as I can, he's going through a difficult situation in his current relationship. Mm -hmm. And he called me as many people do as a therapist, I thought for a referral, but actually to, to talk a little bit and to share a bit about what he's going through. And I really felt like this was some sort of miraculous, like I, I'm not a religious person, but like the, my burning bush, like this was this man who was saying things to me, like, I don't, I doubt myself. I can't trust myself. I feel like I'm being gaslit. Like all these things that I had felt with him. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment of choice where I stopped and I said, am I going to be the therapist or am I going to be me? And I thought I can only be me. And I said, I know exactly what that feels like. That's how I felt with you. And he said to me, trust me, 
the irony is not lost on me. I am devastated to think about what I have done to you. And as I say it, I even have chills. The the feeling of, of understanding that he has now of what I went through is unlike anything I could ever, ever have imagined. And I am 15 years out of this divorce. And if you had asked me three weeks ago, or four weeks ago, if I needed this, I would have said, no, I'm fine. I don't, we're in a good place. But Susan, what this has done to me, it has made me feel so much more connected and seen. And I think the reason he was able to say those things is because I wasn't holding the resentment. I didn't say, I didn't say to him, you did this to me. I just shared my experience. And so people, all of my, all the people I know who I told, they just kept saying to me, like, I don't know anyone else who could hold that information in that loving of a way. Because my first thought, honest to God, when he called me was, poor guy, if the person he has in his life to call to talk about his potential second divorce is his first divorced wife. Right. What a poor guy. And so that compassion and that forgiveness, it's, it's, and it's radiating to my kids. Like my, they have, my kids have a better relationship. I mean, it is so, so, so powerful. So that was my story. And that's why I felt like forgiveness was so important to share. There's so, I mean, the story alone, I think is a golden nugget um, because there's so much that we can take from your story and everything that you're saying to me, I have a different story in my past, um, but there are many, many aspects of it that resonate for me, right? You know, you're talking about what went wrong in a former relationship or marriage, um, you know, and then our parents, our family of origin, our parents, not necessarily being you and I have spoken about my dad's alcohol issues and, you know, the difficulties I've had growing up with that, um, and anger and, and you know, resentment I have about that. So there's so much that I hear in this because what, what I think the ultimate, um, takeaway is right from the top is the freedom for you in all of this, that this has set you free from what if anyone, if you haven't read the book, read the book. I mean, I, I always, it stands out in my mind that scene you wrote about where you were on your hands and knees watching your tears hit the floor because of what he was doing, right? Like somebody else's behaviors were driving you to that low point, um, to get to this point now where you describe the relationship that you have with him and, and how it's permeated. So that power that arose from the forgiveness and, and, and really, I just want to point out, I, I was reading a little bit about forgiveness and you've used both these words of anger and resentment. And they yeah. say forgiveness is the release of that anger and resentment. And the other thing I hear in this, and maybe this um, is something you can, can share more about is it really was a process, wasn't it? It wasn't just like a uh, magic wand was waved and forgiveness happened. This was like, you know, started maybe with that conversation with your therapist and move forward to the conversation with your ex recently. I'm so glad you brought that up. Not only was it absolutely, was it a process, but it was work. I mean, I think what's important is people need to understand that when someone has hurt us, our natural inclination is to protect ourselves, not to forgive. So that's what I think annoyed me so much when people were saying that as if that was the natural thing. No, the natural thing for the nervous system is to protect. So I had to take act actual explicit moves to do something differently. For example, like, so I think resentment in the dictionary, um, part of the definition has perception, like something that you have perceived. And so really challenging my perception. So when I would get a text from him and it, I would notice the resentment because I would have read it as him being domineering or patronizing or whatever the thing that triggered me, I would say to myself, is there another way to see this? And can I respond as if it wasn't domineering, as if it was really just an innocent question? Mm -hmm. So I had to choose 
to not engage in the resentment and not necessarily engage in the forgiveness, but be be questioning that maybe there's another possibility. Yeah, there that that's somewhat profound right there, what you said, right? Think about that because when you're so caught up, the other thing that, that really jumped out at me is when you were talking about, you know, I just want him to acknowledge it. I just want him to apologize or ask for forgiveness or whatever those that was. All of that is just putting the power into the hands of the other person for something that is to your benefit and really is so internal to you because it, it doesn't come from them asking for forgiveness. It comes from you letting go that anger and resentment. Exactly. And, and never, by the way, telling the person what you really want. So like, I want him to somehow magically know exactly what I want me, him to say and say it to me. And then of course, if I told him to say, it, I'd say, well, you didn't really mean it because you said it because I said it, you know, and I can give a perfect example of, of one, what I just said about the text earlier was that when COVID hit, we were leaving New York city and moving to our country house and my husband and I, and I texted the kid's dad and told them we were going and he said something like, well, what's going to happen with the school or something like that. Something like, I think he said something like what's going to happen with the school. And my first reaction, my resentful reaction is I take care of everything. What do you mean? Like, why are you even asking me this? Why are you suddenly involved in this? Why do you think I don't know? Just very kind of defensive and, and um, frustrating. And I stopped and I thought, what would be another way that I could read this text? So I responded, I understand that you are very concerned about the kids during this scary time. So am I. We'll make sure to take good care of them. And of course, they'll connect to you. I didn't even respond. I didn't respond to what I thought he was doing to me. I thought in some ways I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, what if it wasn't my perception? Because my perception is off all the time, especially with someone I hold resentment towards. Right, right. But how did you, so that's that's like a superpower right yeah. there. Um, yep. You know, being able to, I'm sorry, but I'm like thinking about me trying to like write back to someone who I hold resentment for and being kind enough to say, or big enough or whatever it would take to say, I, I understand your fear. Or I understand the under the context of what you're saying. How, how did you do that? Yeah. So it's really hard. I mean, I think one of the things to do is practice, but it's also pausing. So anytime you notice yourself wanting to respond really quickly, you just notice that that's probably not a great place to be responding from. And I do, um, whenever someone is coming at me, I mean, this, I, I learned this as a therapist. I always try to think about the underlying emotion. Like most of us, if we're being, if someone is being kind of nasty to us, it's usually driven by fear. Mm -hmm. And so if you can identify with that, then it will calm everything down. And so I just, I guess the other thing, Susan, is I choose to give for my own mental health, to give people the benefit of the doubt. And then I'll see if they can stand up for it. Could get Because the most important part was my husband, my ex-husband's response, which was, yeah, thanks. I'm so worried about the kids. I hope you're all okay. Because that my response stopped this whole other thing that would have happened right. if I had right seen it from my lens. It's really hard. It's called in cognitive behavioral therapy, taking the opposite action, but you have to notice what your initial action is. And that, that means you need to pause. You know, I always talk about the grace yeah. of space. You yes. cannot, and that's why texting is actually a wonderful way to communicate when it's someone you're having difficult communication with, or you, you do, because it, you have the ability at least to take a deep breath and put a little thought or allow the emotion to calm down in that moment, as opposed to when you're standing in front of somebody you have, or on a yeah. phone, you do have that tendency to just yep. blurt it out. Um, and I, I want to let people know also, there's a great acronym called Jade, <laughs> justify, argue, defend, and explain. Oh, man, stay that's away. a good one. Yeah, stay away from Jade. I think about it as like my kryptonite, like Superman has to stay away from his kryptonite. Yeah. So in my text, right, like I'm not, if I'm justifying, arguing, defending, or explaining, that is not going to get me what I want, which is usually nothing from the, like it's usually just to end that conversation. Right. <laughs> right. Right. 
you wanted to get in the car and start driving out to Pennsylvania. You did not want to be having a discussion with your ex husband about what was happening. Yeah. Exactly. So I just think that was how I, that was the process of, for, of forgiveness and letting go of my resentment. Those little, as I always talk to your audience about those little small behaviors that end up building up to one so that when he called me and wanted to get some help, I didn't say, who do you think you are calling me? I thought, oh, this is a person in pain who's struggling. I only thought that because I had had all those mini opportunities of seeing him as a real person and anyone that we're so angry at we all have to know this we stop seeing them as a real person yes right we just decide that they are this one thing that we've decided they are and they might be that and other things but we have a confirmation bias then we just interact with them in a way that confirms what we already think it's a very myopic way of being um but it is really friggin hard to shift like it is not easy I, and i and, and only, you can only do it when you're ready. And I think in these, I think it's a good tip about these small steps because then you don't have to be like, how can I forgive this person forever? Right now in this moment. Right. But right. let's talk about, because you also um, mentioned this and we've just talked about, you know, the, the, how you feel, how your f- children feel yeah. as you've moved through this process. You know, I was, I also read that forgiveness has been shown to elevate mood, enhance optimism, guard against anger, stress, anxiety, and depression. So there are actual demonstrable mental health benefits to forgiveness. So when your people, I think are thinking about forgiveness, they see it as a gift to the other person. But to me, all of that is saying forgiveness is a gift to yourself. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, the, I think the Buddha is the one who said the story that um, resentment is trying to kill someone with poison, but drinking the poison yourself. Right. I think about that all, or throwing hot stones at someone like you get burnt. Um, 100, anyone who's holding resentment, you know how much it is holding you. Like it is in you. And that other person most likely has no idea they're living in your mind rent free, right? Like yeah. that person has no idea. <clears throat> they have no idea. This is you, the thing you're carrying. And then the question is, what is it doing for you? What is that resentment doing for you? I mean, if you think about someone you don't like right now or someone who who's really bothering you, if I if I do that physiologically, I am see I'm coughing now. My <clears throat> my throat closes, my chest closes, like I get constricted. And so, you know, walking around constricted ends up hurting your body physiologically. Like that is not good for us. And so I feel, I keep joking with my friends that um, in these new interactions with my ex-husband, I keep checking myself for resentment. Like you check yourself if you ring deodorant. Like, <laughs> am I, do I smell like it? I just can't believe I don't have it, but I just don't. And I don't want it. And I just, and if I had it, I would try to release it in some way and realize that it's mine to release. But, um, and, and the way that, I have also, I mentioned about resent a lot, had a lot of resentment towards my mom about how she parented me. And I did a a trick that I think is really, really helpful, which is I knew I was going to every situation with her looking for a confirmation that I was right. Oh yeah. Every time I was right, right. That was drinking more poison. Like in what court am I going to be right? Like, where is this right? Like, what am I gathering this for? Nothing at all, except for hurting myself. And I said, okay, we're going to this event. I'm going to just try to focus on the kind things that happen that she does, not the judgmental, critical or whatever. The... And I walked in and it was like this really nice dinner and there was all this offering. And I just thought, I'm just going to focus on what is being given and what is kind. And my whole perception of her and the evening was different. I, cu- I couldn't believe it, even though this is what I do for a living behavior therapy. I'm like, I'm going to try this myself. I couldn't believe how much it worked because my brain was like, no, she's only this one way. But when I let in another possibility, my heart went right to there. And I just felt better myself. It was the first night after an event with my mom that I actually slept through the night. I usually would have disrupted sleep. And I woke up and I thought, oh my gosh. And she did nothing different. This is what all of you need to hear. I didn't tell her I was doing this. She didn't take a pill. Right. She was exactly the same. 
I was experiencing that in those interactions differently because of my perspective. So you all have the power, no matter what this other person has done to you, you within you have the power to shift how you feel around the other person. Always makes me think of Glinda saying to Dorothy, my dear, you've always had the power. Just click your heels together. Make, you know, it's, it's, yeah. there's so much to the Wizard of Oz that people, you know, d- may not realize. But this also brings up for me something, and I will say this is a personal aspect to forgiveness as well, is I think in forgiveness, there's an element of needing to forgive yourself for hanging on to that anger, for being resentful, for, you know, what can be years of making yourself miserable because you let that person live rent free in your head, as you just said, right? Forgiveness is a gift to yourself, but there's also an element of forgiveness of others that includes forgiving yourself, I think. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. It's such an important point, Susan. And I think Unfortunately, we're better at working at forgiving others before we are working at forgiving ourselves. Like it's, but we have so, I mean, we have forgiveness even before the divorce. Like how are we perfectionistic? How are we hard on ourselves? You know, absolutely. And one of the things I always say to clients, you know, they come into the office and they tell me about something that they've been doing forever. Let's say they, they have compulsions and they want to stop doing them, or they've been in this relationship for so long and they want to get out and they have so much shame about it. Yes. And I always say, you know, whatever you've been doing worked for you at some point. We only keep doing things that worked for us. Right. At some point they might stop working and then it's hard to stop doing that, but they worked for you. So there's, we need to forgive ourselves for using these strategies in other places. Like what worked for you with your alcoholic dad did not work in a relationship. But of course you applied that because that's all you knew. So we have to forgive you for using the coping strategy that you knew that there is no blame. Like that's such, I'm so glad you brought this up. Like what if there was no blame to be had? What if we were all just doing the best we could with the caveat that some people doing the best they could did something criminal. So like this, that's a very, very important thing we have to say that there's some things that are not forgivable. There's some things that are criminal, you know, sexual assault, physical assault, like we have to be clear about that yes. because a lot of times, you know, people say, well, people were doing the best they could. And then I like someone said, and sometimes that's criminal. So they still were doing best, best they could, but it was, so we need to acknowledge both parts, but that how can you forgive yourself for doing the best you freaking could? Every single person is doing the best they could, no matter how much we judge them or where they are in their life. They're literally doing the best they can at this time. Yeah. That's so, and you brought up the word perfectionism. And I, I have an episode with um, Vasya Sarantopoulou on perfectionism. And that happens to be one of my you know, real struggles in life is, and I think it's a common phenomenon for children who are the children of alcoholics. Um, but you know, to forgive yourself for not being perfect is part of this, right? You have to... Um, be able to forgive yourself for doing what you needed to do to get through whatever you were going through and, and, you know, surviving. But I do, I'm so glad that you mentioned that there are some things that are not worthy of forgiveness to another person that, you know, and you mentioned the criminal, um, you know, sexual assault, physical assault, um, truly abusive behaviors we're not, I I know there are people out there saying, and this is my, you know, one of those, I always say that one of the most useless phrases in the, in the human language is yeah, but people who are like everything you just said, Dr. Elizabeth. Yeah. But, (laughs) um, and, and for those of you out there who, you know, truly have a right to your anger and resentment, I guess I would say, I'm not telling you, or I don't think what we're saying is you have to forgive that person, but where is there some space that they do need to find to i'm going to use a phrase let it go or be mm-hmm. able to move forward or be able to move into a new future without that holding them back yeah i guess the way i would think about it is um where does the resentment live in you 
How does it live in you? And can we just be curious about what it might be like if it was just like an inch away? Like just as, as in therapy, we just kind of slowly see what it's like to hold back. Because also, as we've talked about on this podcast a lot, the fight, flight, or freeze response is a response to trauma. So very often holding on to that resentment is a way that the nervous system thinks it's staying safe. So we might actually work on letting go of resentment and with other many other people first before the perpetrator. And I, I don't think you ever have to forgive the perpetrator and, and still be able to release like the power of resentment in your life, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why this topic for this podcast, I feel is so um, relevant is because forgiveness is truly about your future, right? Yeah. It's, it's an, in fact, one of, um, the sayings or the, the, um, phrases that I found quotes that I found that just so resonated with me was Desmond Tutu said, forgiveness says you are given another chance to make a new beginning. And that just for me, you know, I'm always saying divorce is your new opportunity. You, you know, it's your opportunity to have a new future. Forgiveness is, is part is the same. It is you giving you a chance. It may, it, it may, as you said, not have any effect on the other person. It's you giving you a new chance to live anger or resentment free or reduced. Right. Absolutely. And to be in a new relationship with someone else, whether it's romantic or friendship. I mean, I, I feel like when the levels of resentment that I have released from my ex and my parents, I can only describe it as opening up space in me. I just feel more spacious like that. I literally feel more spacious. I feel so that means when things are difficult in my life, I have more of an ability to ride it out because I have more spaciousness. My boat is bigger. Like I just and so it's it's a gift to myself. And I think probably um, even if I wasn't talking about the resentment, it was coming out. You know, I and people don't. I mean, I, I had. I'm remarried, but I just imagine like if you're dating and you're holding all this resentment to an ex old relationship, like that's going to come out sideways. If you're, even if you're not talking about it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and just imagine, or think about what you said earlier that, you know, the, the ability to move beyond and to forgive with your ex has benefited your children and yeah. your current relationship and your children's relationship with their father. Exactly. I wanted to talk about that. Thanks for bringing that up again. So I, oh, I tell the story in the book. So my son, I think he was maybe six or seven. He's so wise. He said, mom, are you and dad friends? And I said, yeah, sure. We're friends because I, you know, we never talk badly about each other. And I felt like that was what you were supposed to show that you're getting along. And he said, not really. Cause you go to coffee with your friends and have dinner with your friends. And you don't do that with my dad. And he was totally right. And flash forward 10 years. And, um, his father has been saying to him, like, your mom has been such a good friend and she's really been helping me. And both of them have been reporting this to me in a way that lights them up. And I just want people to know this is not a, this is so subtle because this is, we got along fine. There was never any animosity between us, but this tenderness that he and I can have now because I've released my resentment is so helpful to them. It is such a benefit. They and they would have been fine without it. Like we don't feel like we need to have to have that. But there's just something within it to be able to see two people. I think they can feel that we've both released our resentment. They just and I can say I feel so bad for your dad and for him to say that I've been a good friend to him. Like that was really powerful for me to hear mm -hmm. that I could be his friend after everything. I mean, what else? And with children and with my, how I feel in this stage of my life is like, all that matters is love. The people I love, sending love, like love is my, my motivation in all mm -hmm. of my work. And so if resentment does not match with that. So I have this little, I have this little thing on my desk where it says like resentment, the opposite resentment is forgiveness, fear, love dishonesty, honesty, like it just is the, like love and forgiveness is just the opposite of resentment. And I have to, I have it 
y'all on my computer. Like that's how much I have to be reminded. So when I'm on the phone with the telephone company or whatever, and they're driving me crazy. I look at that. I'm feeling angry and annoyed with what's something that's happening at work. I look forgiveness and love. And I just turn right towards that. But it's be, it's behavioral. You, you have to really make an intention to do it and then work on it. And we, and it's hard. And I tell you, it's, you start doing, I'm starting to do it closer in my family and I'm hoping that I'll be able to do it with the greater world. Well, and so, you know, the reminders to everyone, what we said earlier, it's a process. This yep. has been years in the making for you in my life and the forgiveness I've been able to, um, you know, work through with my ex relationships, my dad, my own, you know, be, things I've done in the past and forgiving myself, that is a process. And, you know, if Dr. Elizabeth needs little sticky notes on her computer or a little, <laughs> right. Don't be hard on yourself. Give no. yourself the grace of space to do, go through this, but ultimately realize that that forgiveness is a gift to yourself. And in your case, a gift to your children and to the world at large. I mean, you are a greater, as you said, your, your ship is larger. And I know how many people you help every day, both in your, your profession, but also just in your personal life and who you are in this world. Um, so that you have more of Dr. Elizabeth to put out there is a gift to us all and forgiveness helped that. So I, I, what a, what an episode as always with you, it's always so impactful and so many golden nuggets. You know, I just want you all, you know, Dr. Elizabeth comes on, we can talk about big theories, but she gives you real actionable little tips and tools that you can use throughout the day. And I use a lot of them. And so go back and listen to all of her episodes. You know, my listeners love you. How can they connect with you? Oh, I love your listeners. And I love you, Susan. Um, my website is Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. That's drelizabethcohen.com. I'm the divorce doctor on Instagram. Reach out anytime with any questions. I am so happy to be here. And I'm thank you for letting me share my story and the story of my family. And I just hope that our forgiveness story does reach others and helps people know it is possible. I never, ever would have thought it was possible. If you read the book, you'll understand everyone. Yeah. Get the book light on the other side of divorce. So thank you. Thank you for coming back. I'm so grateful for you, Elizabeth. Thank you.